And as I was reading over the, the passage that, that we're in, we're kind of in the middle of a series, Building People. As I was reading through that, my mind started thinking about different things and started thinking about all the ways that the scripture just really interacts with our lives and how it speaks to us. And I was reminded of this game that my kids play. There's a game on their phone called Angry Birds. You guys ever heard of Angry Birds? Don't act like you've never heard of Angry Birds. Angry Birds is the third most downloaded uh, app in the history of apps. It came out in 2010. And some of you are giggling right now because your spouse plays Angry Birds. And some of you are sitting there right now going, Angry Birds, that's not a bad idea. They got the backup quarterback in today. Maybe some Angry Birds is good. Three billion times this thing has been downloaded. Three billion times. In fact, the highest concentration of play is usually Sunday mornings between 11 and 12 o'clock. And it kind of tends to focus right in this area, right in here. The whole premise of the game of Angry Birds is that you sling an angry bird into these structures and buildings and things that are uh, being erected there and being built and uh, there's towns getting built and the birds don't like it. They're, in fact, they're angry about it. And so they have these r- crazy looking eyebrows and you sling them and the user will, all you do with your, it's just a one thumb game really. You sling the birds over into the deal and they knock down stuff. And I was reading the scripture and I thought about how, you know, Whenever, whenever we're, we're being built by God, we, really, we don't encounter angry birds, but we really do encounter some angry words. And Nehemiah chapter 4 is where we are today. And, and, and I was thinking about how sometimes whenever God's building something in your life and things are going good and, and you feel like you're in that sweet spot and you're, you're obeying his will and you're walking in favor and you're doing what God's called you to do, invariably, Opposition and persecution and difficulty will come. And I love this series that we're in called Building People and how for the last few weeks we've been talking about the book of Nehemiah and we looked at the different things that are going on. We looked at how Nehemiah has this burden and this vision and God gives him this mission and how he's going forward. It's a remarkable story about how God builds people, but it's a remarkable story about how God builds us. And in chapter 4, some things start to transition and start to change. Things start to get a little bit different. And Nehemiah starts to face opposition. Now, just in case you haven't been here the last few weeks, or maybe uh, you've been playing Angry Birds the last few weeks, let me bring you up to speed on on the book of Nehemiah. About, About 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came into Israel and basically just destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, took everybody captive, took everybody prisoner, and and really eliminated them as a superpower. This is the period of history, if you went to vacation Bible school, you know, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys and all that stuff, that's kind of where we are with this thing. And so as we walk through that, about 50 years later, uh, there was a change in power. And the Babylonians didn't really rule anymore. Now the Persians were in control. And there was a guy named King Cyrus who looked around and he said, you know, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to send all the foreign people home. If you're not from here, it's time to go home. So King Cyrus starts sending them, sending them back home. Well, a few years goes by, and, and uh, as this continues to happen, King Artaxerxes steps up, and he says, I'm going to continue the tradition of sending people home. Well, King Artaxerxes had a cupbearer who was Jewish, and his name was Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king, is what it tells us in chapter 1, and that doesn't mean he was just a wine taster, but he had all of these different responsibilities. He had a lot of different authority, and different things were going on. Well, in the chapters before, we start to read, and we start to see how Nehemiah is visited by his brother one day, and he asks him, how is Jerusalem doing? The brother says, it's not good. The walls are in ruins. The people are struggling. In fact, the people are so struggling, they're in debt to the people around them. They've mortgaged their wives and their children. They've leveraged everything that they have so that if they miss payments, if they struggle, then they're going to lose their families. The morale is low. People are struggling. Well, when Nehemiah hears this, he has this great burden. God puts this burden on his heart. And so one day when the conditions are just right, he's in front of the king and the king asks him, you know, why do you look so sad? And he starts to tell him about the burden. He starts to say, listen, this is why I'm struggling. This is what I'm dealing with. This is where, where I am. 
And so the king says, I'm going to put you in charge of the rebuilding of the wall. I'm going to put you over this whole thing. I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you some stuff. You're going to do this thing. And so the, the king puts him in place and he starts to go. So here we are in chapter four and we're at the halfway point. Not really of the book, but we're at the halfway point of the story because the walls are halfway built. In chapter 1, this is important, in chapter 1 we see kind of the passion and the prayer of Nehemiah. Then in chapter 2 we start to see the preparation of Nehemiah. Then in chapter 3 we see the people who are with Nehemiah. And now in chapter 4 we see the persecution of Nehemiah. Now that's important for us because anytime you step out to obey God, you will encounter opposition in your life. If you've ever obeyed God, you probably say amen, either out loud or at least inside in that, because anytime you step out to obey God, you will encounter opposition. I want to be really careful here. We talk about the persecution of Nehemiah, and we talk about the persecution of Christians, and we talk about the persecution of the church. I don't want us to use that term very lightly. Persecution is something that is very difficult we may face opposition in our life, but you know, not getting your parking space at Walmart is not persecution. You know, the devil's not fighting you just because you have to walk a few extra spaces down there. And so when we talk about persecution, I understand that there's different levels of opposition and all of us will face different levels of opposition in this room, but I always want us to always be mindful of our brothers and sisters in other countries who don't stand with this freedom who have to memorize parts of the Bible and come together and, and speak parts of the Bible so that others can hear. And maybe hundreds of them will share one scripture together. I want us to be mindful of our brothers and sisters in other countries who have to worship under a veil or under a, clo a cloak of anonymity of our brothers and sisters who are actively being persecuted and killed. In fact, I think we should stop right now and pray for the persecuted church. Could we do that? Could you in your own way just take a moment? And, and maybe you don't know names or names of countries, but you know there are people that are dying because of the gospel right now, and they are actively being persecuted and hurt. Could we just take a moment and with your head bowed in whatever way you feel comfortable and appropriate, could you just pray for the persecuted church for a moment? Father, our hearts are heavy today, and we just pray right now for those who are facing persecution. God, we pray first that your church would continue to grow and that the light and the love and the message of Jesus Christ would be shared all around this world. And God, even though we don't face significant persecution, Lord, there may be a day where we will. But while we have this freedom, we pray that we would make optimum use of it and that you would help us to share your message. Help us to resource those who don't have the resources. God, help us to find ways to share the love of Jesus here and abroad. And for those who are being persecuted, God, we pray that the comfort of the Holy Spirit would even now as we pray, just guard their hearts today. Encourage them today. Lord, that, let them be reminded as we are reminded that it's not over and that you are with them in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to opposition, the book of Nehemiah teaches us quite a bit. When we start to read, we open it up and we see that when it talks about the passion of Nehemiah, we get a couple of verses. When we look at Nehemiah's prayer, we get about six verses. When we look at Nehemiah's plan, we get about eight verses. But when it comes to persecution, we get three chapters. And some of you go, you know, that kind of feels like an outline of my life. Feels like I've had a lot of opposition lately. It feels like, feels like for the last few years or the last several years, it's just been a grind. It's been so difficult. I've got a lot of things happening. Well, anytime you step out for God, you will encounter opposition. In fact, John chapter 16, Jesus speaks to us and says, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to face difficulty, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. 1 Peter 4 reminds us, it says, don't be surprised when you faced fiery trials or when they come your way. Don't be surprised about that. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes, all who desire to live a godly life will encounter persecution. Persecution, opposition, these are part of the obedient life because not everyone has the same dreams and goals that you do. That thing that God's birthed inside you, not everybody shares the same passion for that. In fact, some people may look at your burden and may look at your mission through a lens of jealousy or envy or mockery, which is what Nehemiah faced. Now listen to this. Some of you have this holy discontent that's placed in your heart. And just like we, we don't want to throw around the word persecution, we don't want to throw around the word burden either. A burden is not just something that you watch a commercial and see some hungry kids and it makes you cry one day and now I've got a burden. No, no, no. That's, that's not the burden we're talking about. That may help start some things in your life, but a burden is something that God places in your heart, a holy discontent, something that just unsettles you, something that, that makes you say, I, I don't know what it is, but I just feel stirred. I just feel, I just feel hurt. I feel burdened. Pastor uses this language. It brings a tear to your eye, but it's something that makes you weep. It's something that you carry with you. It's something that you can't get away from. And some of you have this holy discontent that God has placed in your life. God's put a burden in your life to do something, but somebody or something or some culture or some voice keeps throwing a wet blanket on it all the time. People and voices and society keep reminding you of your inability and your lack of resources and your past defeats. In fact, that's what happened in Nehemiah. Let's read Nehemiah chapter four. We're gonna read the first five verses. So stay with me if you will. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Stop right there for a moment. Now, Sanballat's a name that we hear a couple of chapters earlier. We understand that Sanballat and Tobiah are kind of the key leaders of the persecution and opposition in Nehemiah's life. They didn't want to see things happen that Nehemiah did. And when Nehemiah had this burden, whenever he started doing this work, they wanted to do what they could do to stop it. And so we see the name Sanballat earlier, but we see it here again in chapter 4. Sanballat's one of those biblical names that nobody ever really names their kid. You get a lot of good stuff like John and Paul and James and Andrew and all of those good things. You get some Isaiahs and some Isaacs. You might get an Abraham. You don't get a lot of Sanballat, Tobiah, Judas, Tamar, all that kind of stuff. So we see his name here. And he says, you know what? I'm angry about what you're doing. But look a little bit deeper at the opposition that he brings. Look at what he says, at the type of opposition that he says. The first thing he says is this, those feeble Jews, he's mocking their ability. You're not strong enough to do this. Have you ever heard that? God puts something in your heart to do. God gives you a mission. God gives you a burden. But then the voice starts creeping in. You're not strong enough to do this. Do you remember you weren't labeled the smart kid in class? You know, you, you've got a physical ailment that you've been carrying along, and, and I just don't know if you can accomplish this because you don't have the energy or the strength. You know where this attacks us a lot of place in the body of Christ? This attacks us in our senior adults. There's not nearly enough amens there. This attacks us in our senior adults. You know, if you're still breathing, God's got a purpose for you. And yeah, you might be retired or you might slow down a little bit in life, but that doesn't mean you give up your burden. And if God placed a burden in your life to win souls for Jesus, then you need to do that until the day you die. And when you do, he will continue to breathe strength and energy and life into you. But the enemy wants to attack that. He says, hey, they're not strong enough. This. Then, he says, then he says, will they offer sacrifices there? He's mocking their beliefs. Have you ever had anybody mock your beliefs? Oh, they go down there to that church. You know what they do at that church? Oh, don't, don't talk to them. They're too good. They're holier than thou. Have you ever had anybody mock your beliefs? Not in Cleveland. I know that doesn't happen. 
Look at what else he says. Can they finish in a day? He's mocking their intelligence, their ability to plan. He's mocking what they can and can't do based on inside their own brain. Can you lay out a good plan? Can you finish this in a day? You really don't know what you're talking about. How many times has the voice of the enemy come inside your head saying, you know, you just need to be quiet. You don't know what you're saying. He mocks their intelligence. Will they bring stones back from rubble? This is huge. He's mocking their past defeats. The Jews were standing by a wall filled with just stones that was crumbled and in ruins. And as a people, they didn't have any protection. They didn't have any identity. They, they were just scattered everywhere. And, and he's standing reminding them. Sanballat's telling them. He's saying, you know what? You can't because you didn't. You can't because you never were. You used to be, but then you messed it up. And because of your past defeats in life, that disqualifies you from any future events. You know, this is probably the voice of the enemy that, that hits us so hard. You know, you failed when you were younger. Do you remember just a couple of years ago when you dropped the ball? What makes you think that God can use you now? There's grace. There's forgiveness. And if God births a holy discontent in your life, he will equip you and qualify you to do exactly what he wants you to do. Regardless of how or who or what is said about your ability and your past. And lastly, he says this, will, it, will they rebuild back from the rubble burned as they are? He's mocking their resources. You don't have the stones to build this. You don't have the stuff to do this. Do you hear that sometimes? You know, God, you put this thing inside me, but I'm not educated enough to do it. You know, I don't know the right people. I don't have a lot of money to make this happen. And so what happens is we start to feed ourselves with this stuff of, you know, I'm just not equipped. If God calls you to do it, he'll equip you to do it. Amen. If God calls you to do it, he'll resource you to do it. And so what you have to do is stand there and say, Lord, I want to be obedient to your word. And when you place this burden in my life, I'm going to go as far as I can and go as hard as I can at it and trust you for the resources. When people start questioning your resources, it's not your resources when God calls you to do it. It's his resources that will make it happen. And so when God puts something in your life or even in the life of this church... We can say, God, we're going to do exactly what you want us to do, and you're going to bring the resources that you see fit. You can trust God for that. And so here's Nehemiah. He's standing in the middle of all of it. He's dealing with this difficulty. But then, how does he respond? Look at verse 4. Wait a minute. Don't look at verse 4. Don't look at verse 4. Pretend verse 4 isn't in there right now. Because verse 4 says that Nehemiah doesn't really talk to them. He just starts praying and he says, Hear us, O God, for we're despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. That's what he says in verse 4 and 5. But imagine for a moment he doesn't say that. When we read this scripture and we see this encounter, there's a part of us that doesn't want Nehemiah to do that because there's a part of us that doesn't want to do that when we face opposition. You know, when you face opposition and something inside you starts to rise up and you just want to tell somebody off. No, not in Cleveland. Not here, I understand, not any of us. We're talk this is for someone else. But you know sometimes when that boss walks in and tells you to do something and you don't want to do it and you just give her a piece of your mind. I said her so everybody knows I'm not talking about my boss. <laughs> you know when you're in a situation and, and somebody comes in and they start making fun of you and they start ridiculing you and you just want to stand up and tell them where to go and what to do. See, a part of us inside wants to fight those battles. A part of us wants verse 4 to say, and Nehemiah gave him, him, gave him his own angry bird and his own angry word. Because we want to say, yeah, you get them. You fire them up. You just let them have it. In fact, we even talk about that sometimes at the water cooler, at the coffee pot. 
you know, she walked in all smug and arrogant, and I told her, that's not in my portfolio. I don't have to do that. You didn't tell me that when you hired me. They don't pay me enough around here to get that done. Have you ever heard things like that? Have you ever said things like that? See, there's this thing inside us that wants to fight back. But when we look at Nehemiah and we learn about the opposition that he faced, we learn how to handle opposition. See, Nehemiah didn't stand there and volley back and forth with insults. Nehemiah didn't stand there and start throwing jabs back and forth and win the verbal war here. He didn't start insulting and saying, well, let me tell you something about your past and let me tell you something and let me knock you down and stand on top of you and now I'm taller. So many people do that. When I read this scripture, and this is so, this is so amazing. Like I said, I knew I was going to be speaking on this, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be four, chapter 4 or chapter 5, but Pastor, you know, the way he was preaching through the series, chapter 4 landed on me. And so I had some time to prepare, and I started, and I wrote a manuscript out, and that's kind of the, part of the way I study. And I wrote that out Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning. And I was reading over it. And then Baton Rouge happened. And then Minnesota happened. And then Dallas happened. And I started watching on social media all the insults and all the name calling and all the labeling and all the bad stuff that's going down. Can I just tell you that nobody's ever read anything significantly life changing on Facebook? And you think about that. Social media is this place that we just, excuse my language, we just want to throw up on people. And I'm mad about some stuff, and I'm angry about some stuff, and, you know, I could set some things right, and I'm going to take both my thumbs and make it happen. There's a time for us to speak, but there's a time for us to be silent and grieve. Don't ever get... Don't ever let the, the fact get lost in this whole thing that people, people died. That people were hurt and killed. Innocent people were killed. And I read this and I thought about the opposition and the name calling and the mockery. And then I looked at our world. You know, the first thing I thought about when I read this was the political climate. We have candidates that get up. I know some of you are going to hate this. Go ahead, send me the emails. I'll forgive you later about this. We have we have candidates that get up and they call each other names and you know what he he's a racist and she's a crook oh yeah well he takes advantage of people oh yeah well she's a liar and so they go back and forth and back and forth what would happen if in the middle of one of the political debates in the middle of all the insults in the middle of all the jeers and the 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 name calling and all the accusations what if one of the candidates just stopped and prayed I mean, right there with their suits and their fancy shoes and all that stuff. What if they just stopped and prayed? I think we would be really suspicious of that. Ooh, what's going on? What's happening? She's praying. What's happening? He's praying. And we have a lot of Republicans and Democrats and tea parties, and some of you don't even go to parties in here, but listen to this. And that's not your choice. You just weren't invited. That's okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. Wouldn't it be great if we had some, some Republican Nehemiahs and some Democrat Nehemiahs that said, you know what, instead of doing all that junk, I want to get on my face and pray that God would give me wisdom. And we may not see things exactly right in the political realm with each other and across the aisle may be a little bit different, but I'm committed to integrity and I'm committed to moral authority and I'm committed to doing things right. And instead of calling people names, I just want to hear, God, what's the direction that you want us to go? I read that and I thought about our political climate. I thought, and then recently, just the last couple of days, I thought about all this stuff that's going on and how groups of people will attack other groups of people. Man, that's difficult to see. It's especially difficult to see in the name of the church. Can I, again, I already got out there, so I'll just throw it out there to you. You know, part of the racial problems that we have in America is a direct failure of the church. If you're shining the light of Jesus in the right way, then it's a, it's a light that says all are welcome. 
We can't keep relying on government to do what the church is called to do. We can't keep relying on government to do ministry and then get mad at them when they do it wrong. We're called to be the salt. We're called to be the light. We're called to stand up and say, you know what? All are equal and we welcome everyone regardless of the color of your skin because the, the foot at the cross is even. The ground at the cross is level. And we can all say, well, you know, maybe they did this and maybe they did that. But here's the bottom line. There's no point. There's no point in your life where you didn't need Jesus and his grace. And only by the grace of God are you saved. In fact, when we look, you remember our history lesson at the beginning of this thing. And we talked about all the kings and all that stuff. Nehemiah was born into captivity. We don't even know if he ever went to Jerusalem. But we do know this, before he was born, there was a plan set in place for his freedom and restoration. Just the same plan that's set in place for you. The scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and, and before we even had knowledge of God, Christ died for us. And so as the church, we are to express that love to people, even to people who don't act right. Even to people who are racist and arrogant. Even to people who are criminal and people that don't love. We're not called to only love people that act right and love right and love us back. We're called to love a lost and dying world. You know, I read this and I thought about the church. There's name calling that goes on in the church. There's mockery and insults that happen in the church. You, we're a little bit better at it because we can spiritualize it and we can do it a little different, but you know what it's like. Well, don't go over there. That group's a little, whew, they're a little too emotional. Oh, stay away from them, stay away. They're very charismatic, you might wanna watch that. Oh, that group, hey, watch out, that's hyper grace over there. They're a little hyper grace. They're, they're very seeker sensitive. And what we do is we start labeling and categorizing. There's no place where pastoral leadership is called to make sure everybody gets labeled correctly. But the mission of the church is to say that we love you regardless of what label society has put on you. And we love you no, no matter what you've done. The same love that was extended to us while we were yet sinners is extended to you. And so we are called as the church to bring restoration and healing to people who don't know Jesus yet. Let's do that. Let's do that. And when we lift up Jesus, the scripture says that all men will be drawn unto him. Yes. We'll be reminded that when we lift up Jesus, that red, yellow, black, and white are all precious in his sight. Amen? Amen. Amen. So why doesn't Nehemiah volley back and forth with insults? Why does he throw these angry words around? Well, there's a lot of different reasons, and there's some good, and there's some things that you can read for yourself, and you can see, but I want to offer one thing to you today, and I didn't do a traditional outline because I wanted you to take this one thing home. There's this, there's this line in Nehemiah that I think helps us remember why he doesn't stand there and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sanballat, why he doesn't tell him off, why he doesn't tell him where to go and what to do. And this is huge in Nehemiah, but it's huge in our lives too because we're reminded through this one line of how we are to respond and how, are, how we are to react. It's back in chapter two. In chapter two, verse 18, Nehemiah gathers the people together and he kind of preaches this little sermon and tells about God's goodness. And he says these words, it says these words, Nehemiah never forgot that the gracious hand of God was on his life. I think about that. Nehemiah never forgot that the gracious hand of God was on his life. When you remember that God's hand is on your life, that gives you the strength to not fight back, not throw insults, not get on that level and try to volley back and forth, but you can stand there and say, you know what, God's hand's on my life. I'm doing something that God's called me to do. I'm gonna let the Lord fight my battles. Amen. You need to be reminded that God's hand is on your life. Way back in chapter two, as he's standing there, when, he's, when people are questioning the success, back in chapter two, he had already settled it. In verse 20, he said, God will give us the success that we need. 
And you know what? Some of you need to be reminded that God brings you success. If you're sitting there and you, you know, maybe you've built this thing from the ground up and tomorrow morning you've already got your to-do list and you know how you're going to make the cash this week and it's going to happen. And You know, I'm kind of a savvy businessman. I'm kind of a savvy business. Don't forget, it's God that brings you success. The reason why you have this company is because the gracious hand of God is on your life. In fact, some of you shouldn't be here. Some of you should be dead. Some of you should be addicted to drugs and strung out and laying in a ditch somewhere. But the gracious hand of God was on your life. And God stepped in and said, you know, I'm going to redirect some paths here. And I'm going to bring you back to a place because Romans 5 said that he loved you while you were still a sinner. And the gracious hand of God has been guiding you and leading you. It's been leading you into that marriage. In fact, guys, you're not good enough looking to get the woman that you got. But the gracious hand of God has been on your life. And God's been orchestrating some details in your life, even possibly before you were born. And even though you've been born in it maybe this, this opposition and this destruction and this difficulty, don't forget that God's hand's on your life. And he's guiding you through that. And he's giving you this burden. He's giving you this holy discontent. His hand is on you your life. And when you remember that, you can stand in the face of opposition and say, God, this isn't my battle. This is your battle. God, I don't have to stand here and defend myself with a war of words. I'm just going to obey what your word says. God, I don't have to stand here and win the match. I don't have to put it on there and one up somebody else. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give this to you. This is not a passive activity that Nehemiah is involved in. Nehemiah prays first, not last. We're really good at praying last. We're really good at waiting until the buildings blow up before we decide it's time to pray. We're really good at waiting until the tragedy strikes before it's time to to pray. You know what? Nehemiah teaches us pray first. God's our first option. God's our only option. Everything we have comes from him. Everything we have goes back to him. We trust him with everything. Everything. Nehemiah teaches us that we should pray first. You know, some of you are standing in a chapter four persecution right now. You're you're in chapter four opposition. There are people that that are in your life. In fact, you love coming to church because you just get a little bit of a break from that. And you know that tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, you're going to face it. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock when the office opens, you're going to have to deal with it. Or maybe this afternoon when you go home, you're going to have to deal with it. Let me encourage you. Instead of trying to totally defend and win the argument and all that, just just take a moment and pray first. God, help me now. God, I don't know where to turn. God, you're going to have to fight this battle. Prayer is our first option. And when you do that, it will remind you that the gracious hand of God is guiding you. Jason, you don't understand my situation. You don't understand what it's like. I'm not in the majority Let me tell you about Jesus, born as a minority, born into poverty, falsely accused by authority and disrespected according to his authority. But still he loved and he gave and he served and he said, I'm here not to be served, but to serve mankind. So yeah, you're going to face the opposition and it's going to be difficult, but make prayer your first option because God's gracious hand is on your life. Maybe you've got grief today. Maybe you're struggling and you thought you would grow old together and then all of a sudden your spouse has gone early. Be reminded God's gracious hand is on your life. He's going to pull you through. Like the choir saying, it's not over. In fact, We need to be reminded of that again today. It's not over. God's hands on our life. God's guiding us. He's leading us. And that grief that seems so overwhelming, take it to the Lord in prayer. Maybe you're being treated unfairly. Maybe your resources are low. Maybe you're getting ridiculed because of your inability and because of your past defeats. It's not over. God's hands on your life. He's guiding you. He's leading you. Take it to him in prayer. The last thing before we close, we read the rest of the chapter. We see some important stuff. Nehemiah didn't spend all of his time in prayer. He spent some of his time working. 
And we should be the same way. He wasn't leaning on a shovel praying for a hole. You know, we got a lot of that going around in this world. But the scripture says that he looked at the low points in the wall and he stationed some people there. And, and the scripture says that he, he told him, you know, work with one hand and have a weapon in the other hand prepared to fight. And you know, that's important for us too. What does that mean? I want to be real clear with that. That means this. When you go to work with this hand, have a weapon in the other hand. Have the sword of the spirit in the other hand. Be walking around with this. In, so maybe you can't go to work and you can't get your do job done like this, but you can go on Sunday night and you can start reading it. You can start meditating on it. And you can let this word just saturate your heart so that tomorrow when you do face the circumstance, the first thing that pops in your mind is not the insult. It's not the angry bird. It's not the angry word. It's the word of God. Work with one hand, but be reminded we're doing spiritual warfare. The enemy wants to discourage you. And so when those discouraging thoughts come into your mind, you combat those with the word of God. This, this word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is able to do what no one else can do. This word is life-giving for us. And so we read it and we take it with us. And then when you get on Twitter and you see somebody wrote just the most horrific things in 140 characters, I don't have to get in that. I'm staying in this. And when you encounter someone who's been a victim because of their skin color, and you don't know what to say, you know what, you don't have to say something. You can say, you know what, let's pray. Let's pray. God, help me to change. God, help me to, to be sensitive. God, help me to be aware. God, help me to minister to people that you've called me to be around. You're not at your job as an accident. God's put you there. And so while you're there, work hard. But pray hard too. Pray for those people that are around you. Pray for the people that God's placed you in front of. That's why you're there. Allow yourself to have a holy discontent, a, a burden for your coworkers, for your family, for your neighbors. We see that Nehemiah, he went to prayer first. And that's what we're called to do.